Okay. So it seems like this thing comes up with something new every week, and it didn't know what to do. It didn't seem it turned it off. I never had to turn the camera off before, so I didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. So we're back on and we're recording. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's uh, ready to go. All right. Well, let's bow then for a word of prayer. Father, again, we rejoice at this new privilege. We pray that you would bless this class. Uh, help us, Father, to comprehend some of these amazing truths about the, the, the depravity of a, the human being and then to look shortly as to what you've done about all that. So I pray that this would be a, a beneficial time for you and for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we are on page 297 in the notes. This thing is up to date, so that's working. Okay, is this working? All right, we are moving on. We've looked at these, uh, the, the, the effect of the fall on the, the mind and the emotions and the conscience and the will. Today I want to move into the last section of what a personality is, and that is he has a body. So we're going to look at the effect of depravity on the body. Now you might think that's kind of an unusual topic, and in a sense it is. So, so we need to look at it and uh, have some understanding because the opposite is in pre very important for us later. And I want to have this in before we get to the opposite, okay? All right. Um, now there's nothing bad or evil about the body. So that already gives us a change in a certain degree uh, about the, uh, the depravity of it and uh, uh, the seriousness of it. But um, John tells us plainly that the Word became flesh. Now, if the body were somehow defective and depraved, when Jesus took the body, he would also have had that depravity in it. Obviously, he took a body, but he didn't get the, the same physical body that Adam and Eve left us with. And so that was not an issue with him. He was able to maintain uh, his uh, uh, deity without any problem in it at all. Now, Hebrews... Well, John, John tells us plainly that the word became flesh. He actually became flesh. So he had a body. And that's what the, the word flesh here means, okay? Hebrews 2.14 tells us that Jesus shared in our humanity and the, write, uh, the writer quotes from the Psalms when he tells us of the body prepared for Jesus. The body is morally neutral. It's the, it is only the instrument by which we perform and interact with the world and with people. As we have shown, the unregenerate are enslaved to a depraved nature that blinds, hardens, and controls our humanity so that it can only perform what is evil. Jesus, not having inherited that nature, remains sinless throughout his life. I've always wondered if uh, depravity was somehow transmitted by uh, uh, reproduction. And there must be, I, I can't come up with any other explanation whereby that would be uh, changed. Because the, uh, you know, the reproduction was not a case with the Lord Jesus. He was born only of Mary, a woman, not of a man. And uh, which seems to imply also then that Sin, if it is indeed spread by genetics, then it's our fault as men. Now, but that doesn't mean that we do anything positive to accomplish or occur in that. It's just simply that uh, that's how God intended to do it and was able to, to get away from it. 
Wait a minute here. Oh, it goes back. This keeps doing stuff to me. All right. I'm sorry for the, all this stuff. Well, our bodies are unique. They are the means of identification by which we are differentiated from others. Because of our innate selfishness and pride, we tend to focus a lot on attention on ways to enhance ourselves physically. We tend to use makeup or not and wear styles that are acceptable to the Peter we, people we want to impress. For most of us, that means following the styles that are in at a particular time in our culture. Some want to show their rebelliousness by rejecting the in look and wear garish makeup, baggy pants, ragged shorts, cockeyed caps, all signs of the gang among whom we want to belong. Some people are so dissatisfied with how God designed them, or maybe how they have messed up how God has designed them, that they opt for an extreme makeover with tucks and padding and injections and removals and piercings and coloring or tight clothing either to de-emphasize or maybe emphasize some feature. Paul instructed Timothy about women's dress and beauty. He said, I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Jesus tried to give the proper priority when he said, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? On the other side of the issue, the Proverbs warn men against women who dress and act to seduce. The emphasis on the physical can become so dominant in one's life that one may devote himself to it, worshiping it. The body is of much less importance to us than we give it credit. Many have imperfections, even handicaps, which they have to overcome be be to become impressive persons. Jesus went so far as to say it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. At the same time, Paul warns us against those who try to enhance their spirituality through harsh treatment of the body. And he mentioned that in Colossians, but then he says, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I'm sure all of you have probably seen pictures of or heard about people, some of the heathen people, and I'm not sure it's still a case, but it might be, where there are certain heathen people would uh, take some kind of a strap and they pound themselves on the back because they realized that they were sinners and they wanted to get rid of the sin and somehow if you deprive the body of some kind of a comfort that would make a difference. Well, uh, that must have occurred in Paul's day too because it's not going to work. It's not effective. Now the biblical picture of the effects of depravity on humanity is horrible and disgusting. We've already looked at that. We must remember, however, that those who are involved in depraved living do not know of anything better or different, and they are satisfied in that state. I'm not sure that I've ever talked to a person, maybe with the exception of a person who maybe in a service or revival or something decides to accept the Lord and he comes forward for counseling, whatever, but apart from that, just meeting people out in the, in the public, I don't recall ever talking to somebody who willingly and openly said, oh, I know I'm a sinner. Or if they do, they, they, they just throw it aside and say, so what? There's no hell, so I don't have to worry about it. There's no punishment after death, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. But most of them just don't even think about it. It's not something that bothers them. It's not something that, that's part of their life. Moses, it was said of Moses, though he could anticipate great power and wealth as a son of the Pharaoh, it says in Hebrews, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. 
So he recognized that the sinful nature was being uh, abided by by Pharaoh and his people, the people of, of in uh, Egypt. And he realized that that was wrong. God had given him a sense in which he knew that was wrong. And so he felt he'd better be re mistreated than to continue in that kind of culture. Now, our culture asks, what could be so bad about something that feels so good? Eve must have said the same thing to herself about the forbidden fruit. It is the pleasure of sin that causes us to be tempted by it at all the time. James warned us that each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Sin is fun. It is a shortcut to satisfaction. It is the best way to build our egos. We have a wrong object for worship. And we adopt wrong methods of doing it. Part of Paul's indictment of humanity is that we worship and serve created beings rather than the creator. The penalty of sin is death and it is most observable in the body. The curse God pronounced in Genesis 3.19 was, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are and to dust you will return. That was not a sudden event. Adam lived 930 years after his sin. But it was a gradual process, which Paul described in 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The body is only suitable for life on earth. It must be replaced with the spiritual body in heaven. Now, the Psalms indicate that there, even by the time that was written, about a thousand years before Christ, uh, the psalmist said that the average age at that point was about 70. So from 900 years down to 70 by a thousand means that obviously the, the terms that people lived mm. decreased constantly as it went along. And you see it in the... Uh, uh, genealogies that are given in the scripture, especially in early Genesis. And the uh, people lived a shorter and shorter time until they got down to that level. Hey, Julian? Yes. Next question. Uh, Adam lived for over 900 years. Was, and, and you know, we, we now live, what, you know, about 70 years. How was that? Was Adam, when he turned 70, would he have been as a seven year old today? He just got really old, or was it in a way when he was 10, it would have been equal to 50 years? You know what I'm saying? The equivalent. How did that work back then, do you think? Well, I don't know. It doesn't say. Yeah. I, I'm just, what, but, what would you, or did he just maintain a level of maybe prosperity at 30, 40 years old uh, for a longer period of time? I, I was always wondering. When we see here ages like Methuselah and and such, I mean, what does nine hundred years look like at a at a man like that? Is that well, real old or is it just? Well, my assumption is, and it's only assumption, but I don't know any better, is that it was gradual, and that probably, um, who was it? I think um, can't remember the guy's name. But when they got into the promised land. Who was it? I can't think. There was one man who uh, was able to, to take property that was his, you know, when they divided up the property after they'd conquered part of the land. And it talked about him being 80 years old at that point. Now, this is much later, of course, than Adam and Eve. But he was still vigorous, and his, his life was, was uh, very active. Um, so I think that the life probably continued and it was a gradual thing that somehow, uh, um, I don't know if the sin that is committed uh, when it gets into the person's body, um, when, when we receive the depravity, it's probably far advanced 
and a lot of things have already deteriorated in our grand in our our uh, uh, people leading up to us that we are receiving a body that already is defective to some extent in terms of lifestyle or life length. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I assume that he gradually became old and wasn't really old until he got old, but old to him was <laughs> considerably different than for Gladys. Anyway, in Romans 7 it says, when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. Now maybe that little phrase at the end of that verse might answer the question. We bore fruit for death. And that would tend to, to go with my belief rather than yours. But that's, that's certainly no positive answer. But um, we were controlled by the sinful nature. And the passions that aroused by the law were at work in our bodies already, so that it was bearing fruit to death. Now notice what some of these passages say in Romans chapter 6. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. So the body has evil desires which is part of that depravity. That's part of our input from the depravity. Uh, it's the desires of the body that are based upon our mind and our emotions and our conscience who have permitted these kinds of things to occur and so it arrives eventually in our body. But it's not the body that's caused all this thing, it's all the three previous things before this. He said, you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and wickedness. You see, it's offering the parts of your body to sin that's the problem. It's not because the body is sinful, but because it's the, the, the body is the means by which we do whatever we want to do. And if our other things have led us in depravity, then our body is going to do sinful things because of that, okay? And in 1 Corinthians, flee from the sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So it isn't to see the body that's sinning, even if it's a moral immorality, but it's rather the sin sexually against the body. Um, I did a study, I don't remember, some years ago, on homosexuality, I was interested in, in um, this whole concept, and so I did a study. I don't have enough for everybody, but I have a few if some of you want something on it afterwards. And I call this homosexuality the standard example of vile sin, the standard example. And so all I did basically was go through the scripture and print out all the references to Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah. And these are the verses. I'm just going to read the verses to you as to what it is. The following are passages of scripture that refer to the sin of Sodom as a sin which is used to measure other sins. When God wants to explain his attitude toward other sins, he uses that of Sodom a sin which caused him to utterly destroy four cities by fire, slaying all who lived there, and either participated in or approved of its reputation for homosexuality. Genesis 11:13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, and were sitting greatly against the Lord. Chapter 18 says the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see what, see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. This is God speaking. If not, I will know. A chapter later, chapter 19, God sent two angels to go to the city to rescue Lot and his family prior to the destruction of the cities. Before they had gone to bed, all the men of the, of the, from the other part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out loud, or called out to Lot, where are the men who came tonight? Bring them out so we can have sex with them. 
So the sin of Sodom is revealed. Some people who hold to homosexuality as not a sin today, uh, evidently they have never read that verse because they, they try to say that what, what, what was being described in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality, whereas the Bible says it was. In Leviticus, this is the law against homosexuality. It says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable, or the King James translated as an abomination. In Deuteronomy 29, the destruction of these cities was so complete and final that it should cause the people not to forget God's wrath. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and suffer, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboiah, the other two cities, which the Lord overthrew in his fierce anger. All the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to the land? Why this fierce burning anger? And the answer will be, it is because the people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them, gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Even idolatry is compared to Sodom's sin. In Isaiah chapter 1, Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of, the, of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The sin was bringing meaningless offerings or detestable incense, but the penalty was more severe like the falling of Sodom. In chapter 3 of Isaiah, the passage describes some additional charges against Sodom. It says, the look on their faces testified against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Gay pride parades is not something new. Isaiah 13, when describing the fall of Babylon, the prophets compare it to another great destruction. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Jeremiah 18, Sodom is not mentioned here, but the charge is certainly similar. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down in the, at, when they are punished, says the Lord. Again in Jeremiah 23, and among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Jeremiah 19, Edom will become an object of horror. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. As Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown along with their neighboring towns, says the Lord, so that no one will live there, no man will dwell in it. God sees it at horrible. In Lamentations, the punishment on my people is greater than that of Sodom which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. Again, Sodom is used as an example of a great punishment. In Ezekiel, your older sister was Samaria, who lived to the north of you with her daughters, and your younger sister, who lived in the south to, who, of you with her daughters, was Sodom. You not only walked in their ways and copied their detestable practices, but in all your ways you soon became more depraved than they, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Detestable and depraved behavior is even worse than that of Sodom, but still God used Sodom as the measuring. The book of Amos. 
I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You are like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Zephaniah. I have heard the insults of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. Finally, in New Testament, book of Matthew, chapter 10. Whatever village or town that you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. He was giving instructions to his disciples. As you're entering the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your priest rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So even Jesus is using Sodom as the example of extraordinary judgment and condemnation. Chapter 11 of Matthew. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment for, than for you. And you, Capernaum, will be lifted up to the skies. No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. How shall we escape if we ignore such great salvation? By the way, I've been to Capernaum, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it is basically a uh, rundown place. It's just a, a city of ruins. It's been that way for years. This is the condemnation that God brought against it, Jesus did. In the book of Luke, we have a similar passage as it's in Matthew 10. But the instructions were to the 12 then. Here the instructions were the 72 about going to the homes and what happens there. In the book of Romans, what if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? It's just as Isaiah said pre previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Paul uses the example of Sodom as the place where God's wrath and power were shown. Second Peter. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if you condemn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and make them an example, Peter says, of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if you rescue Lot, a righteous man, who is distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire and sinful nature and despise authority. Their lives are considered filthy and corrupt. Jude, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer punishment of eternal fire. They serve as an example. Jude leaves no doubt about the sin of Sodom and the sentence it draws. In the book of Revelation, upon the death of two witnesses, John refers to Sodom as well. 
Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. So he's using the, the name Sodom to apply to this place in the future. Romans chapter 1 is probably the clearest and the longest and toughest explanation as to what homosexuality is all about. Much more clearly detailed here than anywhere else. He talks about the sin of homosexuality and twice God said he gave them over to shameful lusts. The end of the chapter condemns those who approve of the behavior and promote it, even if they do not participate in it. So the people who allow it without condemnation, in a sense, participate in it. To the believer, inclusivism cannot include sin. To hate what God hates cannot be against a crime. To let people know of God's attitude should not be censored. To excuse it or call it gay is to fall into Satan's deception. It is significant that when speaking of God's wrath, he mentions idolatry and homosexuality specifically in detail. Then he adds a whole list of other weaknesses, wickednesses as well. Homosexuality is again one of the major examples of sin. 1 Corinthians 6 has an interesting passage. We're specifically told of the penalty for sins, including homosexuality, specifically mentioned there, as excluding one from the kingdom of God. The good news is that while some in Corinth had been homosexual, their lives had changed and they had been cleansed from it. This passage explains that the certainty of condemnation ends with the possibility of redemption. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, talked about some of those who had become Christians, saying they had been homosexualities, but God had saved them out of it. So it is a forgivable sin, although you may wonder the way it's described. Here's my summary. The reason that homosexuality is such a horrendous sin is that it desecrates and perverts the typology of the makeup of marriage. God uses the relationship between husbands and wives as illustration of the relationship of Christ to the church, as ex explained in Ephesians 5.22. It is also a perversion of the description and purpose of marriage, as given in Genesis 2.24, where we're told that a man should leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, when the only persons in the existence at the time were male and female. And that union is only possible because of the complementary physical differences of creation described by the psalmist as being fearfully and wonderfully made. Moses learned the penalty of breaking the holiness of a type, but he struck instead of speaking to a rock to produce water. I did this several years ago and I thought, it seems like this would be a logical place to mention it. Questions? I, did I see your hand? For, I guess not. No, no, no. Go ahead, Matt. I, I was going to tell you that's excellent. And um, this is the this argument is at the tip of the sword right now, and um, it's amazing dealing with uh, church leaders, churches, and people that call themselves Christians who look at God's word. And I, I remember talking to a gentleman, and we were talking about this, and I said, well, "Let's go to the Old Testament." Let's look at the law, and he goes, it's not, that's not, uh, it doesn't apply today. I said, so you're basically saying everything was false? And he goes, I don't, I don't agree with that. I go, the Holy Spirit wrote that through Moses. Okay, so I go, so you're discounting Moses. I go, how about the Apostle Paul with the Romans 1? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, there is a movement in Christendom right now to, uh, to downplay all the writings of Paul. Right. And so there's a strong movement. Uh, with that, and so he said, "Well, Paul, uh, he, there was things that were temporal and was re related to uh, the times and, and the people that he was discussing with." And so, we're trying to take away that. But I said, "How about Jesus?" I go, "Jesus quoted the Old Testament. 
and I go, I, I think about right after he gave the Beatitudes and, and, and uh, Matthew 5, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. He is confirming the truth of the Holy Spirit provided by Moses. And we look at the canonization of, of God's word and God in his spirit and movement made sure that we got the truth necessary in order to be properly communicated from him. And I, I think about that, what an unbelievable compromise that the church is doing in a disservice by allowing this to be considered not sin. And, and now it, it's at a point where if you speak up against this in, in several circuits, you are gonna be condemned and stuff. And so there's the, this movement now, and um, it's sad, it really is, but this is right at the tip of the sword. I, I pray to God that people that are caught up in that sin come to the recollection and understanding that what they're living is, and, and they get the help they need and they become full-fledged believers and are in the church of Jesus Christ. I'm moving away from that. However, is that is not, that's what it is, it's sin, period. There's nothing, no other way to describe it, and like you said, it's an uh, abomination. Yeah, it's God's description is, is yes. pretty, pretty solid. So, There's I'm sorry, much reason rant, but I have to tell you, I, I deal with arguing about this at least once a week with people. Okay. That's horrible. Huh. Yes. I, when I used to be with the former pastor and stuff, uh, they were part of like the focus on a family love one out. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that people usually never mention, but how proud God is of his creation. Mm -hmm. And homosexuality destroys creation. I mean, you, we're, here, we're here to multiply and create families. Homosexualities can't really do that. You can't have children. You can't, you know, it, it's impossible. And I think that's the one thing that people never mention that it's the destruction of the family. It's, it's what does God tell you to do? Be fruitful and multiply. You can't do that. You know, this kind of. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a horrendous thing. It's been around for centuries, as far as, well, you're talking about. Sodom and Gomorrah, you're in chapter 18 and 19 of Genesis. It's that far back. But it's, it's an attempt to try to gain the pleasure of sex without having sex. Because neither a man or a woman with another man or a woman can actually have sex. It doesn't work. You're not built that way. We're created with complementary bodies and sex as God designed it. And even the, the pleasure of sin as God designed it is limited to a man and a wife. It cannot be accomplished any other way. It's, it's, it's fake. It may feel good, but it's not sex. And I think that's probably why it's so horrendous. People are trying to, to uh, have the pleasure that God intended us to have without following the rules of it. So that, that's not going to work. Yes? I think worse than that, you know, that the homosexuality is destroying the body as a family, but you think of the transgender. That is destroying your body even more than, than what the... Um, their homosexuality when when they go through these these operations, it, especially what they're uh, doing well, with children. It's, uh, it's an advancement upon it, but you know what? They're destroying. It's a different motivation that they're getting at here. The physicians who are following this are promoting it. I saw an interesting interview on uh, YouTube this week. Uh, it. it uh, presidential candidate whose name I can't pronounce, you know, you know the one I'm talking about, the Republican candidate, um, was interviewing two women who were in their mid-twenties, both of whom had, while they were 14 or 15, had undergone all of the attitudes and actions and surgery to change themselves from girls to boys. 
and they were they were horribly upset that they had done it. They didn't they didn't blame anybody else for doing it because they had made the decision themselves. But they felt that they were too young to make that kind of a decision. And uh, here they were, both of them, they were without breasts. The one gal even had her, her uh, uterus removed. And so there was no possibility of children, probably no possibility of marriage. And here they were in their mid-twenties trying to figure out how do we overcome this thing that we have done. Uh, I've never heard the quite th so brave and open as these two women did in explaining what, what they had done and how bad it was. And uh, what the only thing they promoted is that said this should not be permitted to anybody unless they're at least 18 years of age. So in other words, they would be legally independent and can make a decision on their own, supposedly uh, a better decision. But, uh, anyway, let's go on. Uh, <coughs> Some other things. We talked about the the nature of sin. Where are we here? The nature of sin. The source of it is in the heart. It's description. It's falling short of God's glory. It's failures, both commission and omission, attitudes and actions can be sinful. Its primary trait is motivation, and its consequence is judgment. Take a look at the notes. The source of sin in an individual is in the heart. When God destroyed the ancient world through flood, he described the people this way. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. What a description. And that's God's. That's not somebody else's interpretation. The psalmist wrote, The Lord knows the thoughts of man. He knows that they are futile. The prophet Jeremiah stated, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Man does not realize that he is a sinner until the law is presented to him, revealing his failure. Notice Paul's testimony in Romans 7. He said, Indeed, I would not have known what sin was, except through the law. For I would not have known what, really co what cover coveting really was, if the law had not said, do not covet. Some people have taken examples out of the early chapters, especially of Genesis and, and the Pentateuch, because uh, people, some people there took a second or third or more wives and they said, well, but, you know, in the Bible, it's, it happened and it doesn't say anything about God uh, cursing them for it. But the truth is, that happened before the law was given. And the Bible here is telling us that without the law telling you what's wrong, you wouldn't know. So if children grow up never understanding that certain things are wrong, you just don't do them, how are they going to know? You know, our natural bent, even as a child, is to do things that are not right. Because it seems exciting and attractive. One of the terms used of sin is transgressions. Which refers to crossing a line or entering a place which is prohibited. It is similar to our use of the word trespassing. The scriptures also calls our failures sin. Romans 3.23 states that we all fall short of the glory of God. In other words, that's God's definition of sin. James 4.17 Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. <coughs> so we can sin either through action or lack of action. Sin may not even be evident. In the future judgment, Jesus Christ will expose the motives of people taking them into consideration in that judgment. Romans 7, it says, He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. So you see, the attitudes that you have, apart from any action, 
is also sinful. If it seems that sin is inclusive of nearly everything we do or don't do, you're right. It has to be removed through forgiveness and replaced with a new nature found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no, no answer to sin apart from that. Uh, let's go into some of the, the next one here. The evil of sin. It's not so much seen in that millions are damned for it as that Christ died for it. It cost the blood of Christ to pay for it. It's Thomas Watson who wrote that in 1689. So these are the erroneous concepts. Let's take a look at some of these. Back to the notes. No one in this world is ignorant of the presence of evil, and many are trying to discover the causes of sin so that evil can be controlled or eliminated. They might call it a crime. You know, the public doesn't use that word sin very frequently. There's a, uh, I, I like to do crossword puzzles. And very frequently there's the question is, what do people talk about who preach? Of course, the answer always is sin. A little three-letter word. I know that one as soon as I read the question. Because that's just the common way of putting it. Now, many tie evil to the environment, the culture, poverty, or just weakness. And you'll find all of those in the newspaper almost any time of the week, wherever it talks about the concept of crime. These are the things that people feel are the cause of it, and therefore are the key to the answer to it. So they want to change the environment so that it's, and it's uh, different. The culture. So they talk about getting rid of certain horrible movies, maybe, so it doesn't give examples to young people. Poverty, of course, is considered one of the strong reasons for people to commit sins. And just weakness. There are at least four major ways by which the world explains sins and its solution. The evolutionist believes that we are still developing as a species and argues that we just have not had enough time to develop our moral perfection. By our continuing experience, we will eventually and gradually become better. And since these people speak in terms of millions or billions of years, this does not engender much hope that we'll ever reach that perfection. <laughs> but evolutionists actually believe that. You know, we are caused by our development from apes or whatever, and somewhere we got into this bad stuff, and it's, we just have to develop to the place where all of that bad stuff is overgrown and out. Now, some believe that the problem is genetic, that these sinful traits are inherited. The problem is that they also believe that the, with proper breeding, that sinful gene can be identified and maybe removed. If we could at least get one person to that place, maybe we could then clone him. But some people believe it is genetic. In other words, it's passed on. We, we really believe the same thing. But it's because of God's action on, on our behalf or against us. But they believe it's just, just genetic, taking nothing into consideration, into consideration that's uh, supernatural. Now, sociologists believe that the evil is the result of a bad environment or the circumstances in which a person grows up. It's only as bad or a bad response to bad conditions. We need to declare war on poverty, provide all sorts of food and clothing and other necessities and give proper examples. The United States and the United Nations, mostly with our money, is fighting illness, starvation, and poverty all over the world with little success. The educator is it assume that people are just ignorant. If we can only teach people what is right, they will do it. If you tell young people that smoking is dangerous, they will not do it. 
If one just says no to drugs, one will be overcome the temptation to participate. Explain to people that they must be tolerant, generous, kind, and broad-minded, and disparagement and conflict will be eliminated. Where differences exist, comparisons are common and lest one should appear dominant, judgment tends to be relativity and equal acceptability of all views. No view is superior to another. We call it pluralism, achieved through diversity training. Majority cultures begin to be limited in respect to minor cultural standards, eliminating condemnation of conflicting morals. Internationally, we're trying to reverse the judgment of Babel by uniting behind a single language, a single government, economic policy, and legal standards proposed to us by the term globalism. The hope for the world is found in making all of this known to everybody. A Lutheran theologian made a significant observation. Quoting, he says, while classical theology conceived of sin as rebellion against God and transgression of God's law, the new theologies view sin in terms of failure and brokenness. Sin is refusing to measure up to one's highest potential or shirking responsibility rather than deliberately breaking God's commandments. The remedy for sin, it is said, lies in a new understanding of ourselves rather than a faith in a divine savior. I'm going to stop there because I've got another whole page and I haven't got time to cover it all. That page is all fit together. So, but We're about done looking at the depravity. So in case you wonder why does people act the way they do, there's the, the biblical answer, part of it anyway. And we'll finish that up next week. And then we will get into something entirely new. What, what happens to these five things, our mind, emotions, will, and so on? What, what happens to them when they become a Christian? And we'll look and see what the Bible tells us about what happens to the Christian when he becomes one in relationship to these things. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, it's tough to look at these things and see the awfulness of it. But we learn from it who you are and what you are and what you expect. And we realize that these are standards that are beyond the possibility of our ever achieving in this life. We're going to need something supernatural. And that basically is the message of the scriptures. There is an answer, but it is supernatural. It is an answer you have provided, not anything that we'll come up with, with all of our polls and research and ideas that they just are not going to match it and accomplish anything. So I thank you for this information. Help us to, to adjust if we need our attitude toward sins, maybe some sins that we do frequently. Help us to get arranged with them in such a way that we understand your attitude against sin. We realize that the sin of Adam and Eve was eating a piece of fruit. And yet it caused eternal death. Your attitude is very strong and it's correct. It's the one we ought to adopt. Don't let us fall short of evaluating it like you do and avoiding it in every way we possibly can. Be with us and lead us this week as we live our lives. Help us to be aware of our lives and help us to be alert to those occasions when we slip and fail 
and do not bring you the proper glory. Help us to confess it and get it forgiven so that it will not be held against us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. I have uh, I have three copies of this homosexual. I think if anybody wants it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, do you have a copy of your outline? No, I got outline for uh, the sin part. Yeah, well, you don't have that? No, I don't. Thank you, John. I'll bring up the date then. You get another new one next week. Was that? Another, one? Okay. another new one next week. Thank you. This is the constant argument. Right here. Uh, the professor is that I was told after giving the promotion I used the word sin. We didn't see June in the What did you see in the other game? I said, well, no, we'll just talk about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me see that again. That's how it leaves the Bible. You got it. That word. How good is it if we're not talking about it? Right. I may have an answer for your question. I think it's one. I'm going to see this guy on camera. <laughs> They were living in uh, it's called uh, 204. Oh yeah, I've heard that too. That's that's good. Yeah. Where they actually live. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I, I was, uh, I was, I, I forgot all about that. But I, I just were windows open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have been to Vegas before. You never saw it. No. Yeah. They pump in pump of water today. But I, that's why people didn't. I think probably, believe it or not. At 900, you probably have as good as you did when you were 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be nice. Oh, that would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. I always wondered, is, are, are, they, they, are they still at 80 when they're 80? And then when they're, oh, when they're 200 and 300. Yeah, I think that 80 was the equivalent of 20. Yeah, I I don't know what the Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it was it was interesting, but I forgot about that.